Hello, everybody. This is Mike here, and you're listening to the All Metal Mode podcast with our very special co-host, Mr. Ooh, Mr. Dorian Cook. Um, if you want the best American-made digging tools made with American steel, each tool is heat-treated individually by George Lesh himself. Check out PredatorTools.com or give Pam a call at 856-455-3790. They are good tools. The best that I've ever used. It's all I use anymore. It's all I've used for a long time. Uh, All Metal Mode, we've got a couple articles, a couple more working on. Don't forget the forum. Uh, It's going okay. It's kind of slow. You know, I know forums are kind of old school, but, you know, if you're tired of, uh, you know, I, I don't hate social media, but it just... It encourage you know forum encourages more conversation, and I real I've really missed that. So that's why the forum came about. If you want to join, have some real metal detecting conversations, please, uh, <coughs> please join. We would love to have you. Um, let's see. Next, this this coming Friday night, we have David Canterbury. I hope I said that right. Um. Uh, David Canterbury is a survival expert who co-starred on the reality television show Dual Survival for two seasons. Uh, It aired on the Discovery Channel. He's the author of Bushcraft 101, uh, made the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, He's written a few other books, Survivability for the Common Man and Advanced Bushcraft. Um, in 2015, he co-starred in a survival series called Dirty Rotten Survival, which was on National Ge- Geographic Channel. He is also a detectorist. He's been posting a lot of pictures on his Facebook page. If you get a chance, check it out. It's David Canterbury, C-A-N-T-E-R-B-U-R-Y. I have spoken with him on the phone. We've gone back and forth uh, in Messenger. Seems like such a nice guy. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as many of you know, I've at least temporarily moved to Friday nights, but actually Friday night, it's going to be Dennis Wynn and Gypsy Jules are going to be hosting that show. Um, that's Steph's birthday Friday night. And, um, I kind of got in trouble for starting a show on Friday. So close to her birthday. And also they are both big fans of his. So I'm like, well, you guys do the show. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, you know, if Dennis sticks around, he's going to do Tuesday nights with uh, Dorian, and I will permanently be moving to Friday nights. Uh, that is not set in stone yet, but that's kind of what we're hoping for. But Dennis isn't sure he wants to do it, um, y- you know, uh, dedicate himself to to a whole night a week but if not he'll at least be filling in like he has been for a while so uh yeah there's that um if you guys have any ideas for podcast episodes especially for me on friday night um if you have issues uh if you have um article ideas things that you want i'm working on some how to articles um joanna told me she wants to see more how-to articles so we're going to work on that and uh see how that goes so uh yeah check uh you know if you have any ideas if there's something you'd like to to hear about us talk about or an article or whatever get a hold of me let me know you can email me at allmetalmode dot allmetalmode at gmail dot com um of course messenger mike hare on facebook um you can call me 937-414-4578. You can reach out to me like that. There's, you know, a number of ways you can get a hold of me. I always enjoy talking metal detecting. So uh, tonight, as many of you know, is part two of Quantrill's, Quantrill's Raiders. Um, if you haven't listened, uh, I mean, you can listen tonight, obviously, but you, you missed a heck of a show last last week. I'll tell you, I was going to make sure Dennis was had it going good. It was his first time running the show. And I was going to 
jump in the shower and spend some time with the kids. I sit here the whole time through the show. I just couldn't. Well, <laughs> last 15 minutes, maybe I jumped in the shower. I took my phone and I cranked up the volume so I could listen. And I listened to the whole show, but, uh, it, it was really good. And I'm really looking forward to tonight. So yeah, let's, let's get started. Dorian, how are you doing tonight? Hey, Mike, I'm doing great, but I, I made one little mistake here that I need to rectify right quick. I need to leave the mic for about a minute. I forgot to bring bottled water in here because I oh, need some water. Oh no! I'm going out to my car. I just I've got a, a fresh six pack of bottled water out there. I'm gonna grab one and bring it back in. So well, I'm I'm you... I'm okay to talk. I can keep okay. talking. <laughs> okay, you fill the ear, and I'll be right back. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, I guess something else I could tell you. I've been doing a weekly YouTube video, kind of to fill. You know. I love what Dorian's doing, and we get so many compliments, but a lot of times I find myself just sitting here listening in uh, to his awesome shows, and uh, I, so I decided to do, you know, I love talking metal detectors and technical and uh, different things, so last Friday I did a show on, um, the, the Friday show was on um, test beds and test gardens and nail board tests. Well, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I'd also done a YouTube video, the same thing. And it was pretty much the same thing. If you listen to the podcast, you, you heard it on the show. I I feel so strongly about it. I wanted to uh, uh, share it on a different platform. So, uh, yeah, next Friday, I've got something in the works. I've actually got another guest. I'm hoping I got to gotta confirm the date. Um, really interesting person. Um so yeah, good things coming, and uh, I'll, I'll at least be until this series is over. I'll um, except tonight, I'll be on Friday night, starting again next week. It should be at least two more night, two more Friday nights after. Well, three, including this one coming up. Okay, I'm back. All right, I just finished up. Okay, so we all ready to to get started here? Yep, yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, well, we're going to make, make a little history tonight. Uh, I think for the first time publicly, at least, you know, in our generation, we're going to really begin to understand what happened in Missouri and Kansas was, was war on a scale never seen before or since in this country. It wasn't like any other part of the civil war, Mike. It was so uh, amazing, such a different type of battle and fighting that the guerrillas went through. Um, you know, in part one, we saw how uh, William Quantrill suffered a great wrong. You know, he and his brother were on their way to California to hunt gold. They were going to stay out of the slavery conflict completely. And they couldn't because... They were viciously attacked in their camp by um, basically murdering thugs uh, dressed in federal uniforms with red stripes down the legs of their, tra or excuse me, not red stripes. I, I think I said that I was wrong. It's red leggings. They had red leggings that ran from their ankles and they were made out of leather and they ran up to their knees. I suppose they'd make good snake guards <laughs> if they were leather, but... Anyway, they were called the Red Legs, and so they killed his brother, if you recall, and they terribly wounded him, and he was over six months recovering and almost died if he hadn't been found by, that, by an Indian. Uh, he laid there for three days without any treatment of his wounds. So we saw that his response, uh, yeah, I mean, it's easy to understand a revenge motive, right? But look what he did. He went and joined the very unit. He joined the Red Legs, the very people, you know, from I mean, the very unit from which the people had come that had, that had killed his brother and tried to kill him. And then over a period of time, he was accepted by them. They believed he was pro-union, you know, pro-abolitionist, pro-Yankee, pro-everything that they believed in. And they accepted him as a comrade and one of their own. And they were totally deceived, and one by one, he eliminated all 21 men who were in that party. Mike, that is not, um, that's not the act of a sociopathic murderer. That is a, an act of a man 
who was a nationally gifted military genius, he worked out a strategy against overwhelming odds and went right among them. That's an incredible feat. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that kind of uh, says or points out that very thing of what he did. It says, what king going to war to make, uh, or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults where he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. So Quantrill's baptism into warfare was actually against overwhelming odds. And that would remain a trademark of his entire experience in the Civil War. They would constantly be taking on overwhelming odds and the uh, narrow escapes and the havoc uh, and destruction and death that they wrought against those overwhelming odds is truly uh, what makes this story so incredibly amazing. So let's, uh, let's keep in mind now, as I mentioned, that this war along the Missouri-Kansas border was not like the Civil War everywhere. If you're following along on the supplemental photos, the second uh, uh, page has the uh, map, and I have circled the area so you can see where what we're going to be talking about as we go through, I mean, the area of the country. You know, it's not exactly just right on the border of Kansas and Missouri, but say within a a 50 to 100 mile radius of that border. Um, this is where 90% or 95% of all the actions we're going to be talking about were fought. Now, as I said, you know, what we're going to see was that the conflicts they engaged in, and I, you know, I think most people have, uh, they know that the Quantrill's famous for supposedly massacring the people in Kansas, as I mentioned, in Lawrence, Kansas, excuse me. And that we'll get to that, you know, we'll take it chronologically as we come to it, but not, it won't be tonight. It'll be in another part. But uh, people don't know about the battles he fought. They don't know how many battles he fought. They think, oh, yeah, he was probably in you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 big battles like most of the Civil War soldiers. No, he wasn't. He and his men were in hundreds of battles, hundreds. And the relic hunting and metal detecting community has, has been ignorant of this. And therefore, while you have you know, a number of Civil War relic hunters, detectors in Missouri and the surrounding states that, that hunt the... Uh, regular Civil War battles that took place in Missouri. Uh, there weren't, I don't know, there was one in Kansas that I know of, Baxter Springs, but I'm not sure there were any other. There Probably there were skirmishes that were not with the guerrillas. But anyway, because uh, General Joe Shelby and what was called the Iron Brigade operated along that Missouri border, and they were regular Confederate cavalry. Uh, the Yankees like to call them bushwhackers, but they were not bushwhackers. They were just very, very effective uh, cavalry. <laughs> I'm looking out the window here and a uh, beautiful mama deer and a little baby with spots just walked out of the woods. They're out here in the field right in front of me putting on a show. <laughs> Watching that little one bounce across the field following his mama. You know dear. the little ones are the tastiest, right? Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm so only what kidding. You're, what you're telling me that, that Bambi's mother's safe but Bambi isn't, huh? Mm, no. <laughs> All no, right, but we is good. Yep, yep, go ahead. We digress. <laughs> we digress. Um, the fact that these men engaged almost, sometimes almost daily, in, in, in almost in death defying battles, as you're going to see here just, just momentarily, is we're going to get into this right away. But I, I want to bring out the point that this constant exposure to maximum combat stress. Uh, maximum desperate circumstances, always facing overwhelming odds. It honed these men with each combat. It, it was like sharpening a knife. You know, you just keep sharpening and sharpening until, uh, you know, like in the cartoons, you drop a hair on the upraised knife blade and it splits when it hits the knife. That's sharp. Well, that, that, that's what it did for these men. You know, they were already uh, without natural fear uh, because the men that came to Quantrill had suffered 
uh, losses of family members to the other side, and they came with a burning hatred of anything wearing blue. Now, these men were all volunteers, so we keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, once in a while, they would catch a couple of sentries or something and uh, capture or, or kill them or whatever. But, you know, 95% of all the battles they fought, they were outnumbered. And yet they triumphed and conquered time and time again. And even when they couldn't win and when they were desperately trapped, we're going to see Quantrill was an absolute brilliant. He could not only plan strategies for long-term operations, you know, like Robert E. Lee could, for example, but he was also like Stonewall Jackson. He could analyze the circumstances around him, Mike, and in a moment come up with a plan. He, he, could, he could look at all of the options and he could eliminate the ones that didn't, didn't offer much hope of success, and he would pick the one that had the best chance every time. Now, he made mistakes, as we're going to see, but he learned from his mistakes. And uh, he became one of the most brilliant strategists, military strategists, because in, the, in that he was both a Robert E. Lee and a Stonewall Jackson uh, combined in, in, in the way that he approached his enemies. Now, let's start looking at some of these um, incredible combats they got into. But let me uh, make one quick comment here before we start. You know, we really owe a great deal of gratitude to Captain Harrison Tro for the book that, that he uh, wrote to, uh, that, with the help of this man named Birch uh, on Quantrill's early history and exploits. Um, you know, I, I mean, because it's the, only, it's the only source besides, you know, I had the unusual uh, privilege of having access to Jesse Lee James, uh, Jesse James' grandson. And he told me what his father told, or his grandfather told him about Quantrill and about the time that he served. Now, please understand tonight, Jesse's not going to be in these battles because he's not there yet. Jesse's uh, only about 16 years old at the time the things that we are uh, studying tonight uh, took place. So Jesse will come into uh, the picture, I think, in, in part three. Now, what I wanted to point out, though, when you look at Tro and the way he wrote this book and his vocabulary, right away, you, you cannot, Mike, but conclude that the guy is a highly intel was a highly intelligent and gifted storyteller. And you know what that proves to us? It proves that Quantrill did not surround himself with sociopathic murdering thugs as official history proclaims them all to be. Now, he had a few of those that joined his command. Um, modern history uh, says that, that a man called Bloody Bill Anderson was one of those, and we'll get into to, to him too, but he's not on the scene yet. So we'll bring him in at the right time. Uh, but he didn't stay with Quantrill. He broke off and you know started his own unit. And Quantrill and him did not see eye to eye. Uh, but I would encourage our listeners to be really alert tonight and listen carefully because a number of leads to potentially unknown Quantrill battle sites are going to be coming out as we study what, to me, are the most unique of all civil warriors. Okay, let's get started. We're going to cover uh, what Tro calls the fight. He doesn't call them battles. He calls them fights. But uh, let's just, you know, uh, translate that in our minds. When you hear the word fight tonight, it's a, it's a battle. Uh, you could call it a skirmish because of the number of men or whatever. But I call it battles because of the intensity of these battles. And, you know, you're going to feel almost exhausted when we get done because you're just not going to hardly believe uh, what these men went through. Now, Birch was guilty of, you know, taking uh, Tro's statements and adding a little purple prose. You know, I think most of us know what purple prose is. Uh, Louis L'Amour wrote, and he used a lot of purple prose. 
you know, real flowery descriptions of things. And I think Birch tried to do that. And I'm going to try to, you know, just eliminate some of the purple prose and, and stick more to, to the facts. So I might, if you're following along in the book online or something, um, you might see me, um, uh, use a uh, speaker's license here, you know, and, and change the wording of some of these sentences without changing the meaning of them. Okay, here we go. So Quantrill's organization was, you know, real young. If we back up just a second, uh, you know, he started out with uh, eight men, uh, you know, and they they were given in, uh, in the book, it's uh, the, uh, the chapter of this book, that contains these names uh, is called Quantrill's First Battle in the Civil War. And they were names like William Howard, James and John, Little Edward Coger, Andrew Walker, son of Morgan Walker, um, John Hampton, James Kelly, and Solomon Bashman. Now, if you're following along with the uh, supplemental photos, you'll see I have pictures of none of these men. I have not found any pictures of these original eight men yet. I'm hoping to get one of William Howard, but I do not have it yet. So I posted what I could find, and uh, so they all they all started out with Quantrill, a total of nine men, and we kind of you know went through their first battle, and then uh, as we got towards the end of the last chapter we covered there, we uh, Tro tells us that the eight guerrillas had now grown to fifty, and he mentioned some of the new recruits, David Poole. David Poole's picture is in the supplemental photos. John Jarrett. John Jarrett's picture is in the supplemental photos. And I will have more to say about that picture because it reveals a secret to us. Uh, study that picture of John Jarrett and see if you can figure out the secret that it reveals. Uh, William Coger, Richard Burns, George Todd, his picture is included in the supplemental photos. George Shepard and Coleman Younger's picture is in the photos. I did not include a picture of Harrison Tro because uh, his picture is in the supplemental photos of part one. If uh, you're just catching up with us, uh, you can scroll down through the AMM page and find uh, supplemental photos part one, and you'll find Harrison Tro's picture, a couple of pictures of him. So we were told that, you know, Quantra was made captain. His actual commission from... Um, uh, Jefferson Davis uh, was not only to operate as a, you know a partisan a partisan ranger uh, uh, company on the border. Uh, it, he was given the rank of colonel. However, you have to understand that these men were Southern men, and the way they thought, captain was almost a generic word like boss. You know, they might have said Quantra was made boss. They didn't care if he was a captain, a major, a colonel, you know, whatever, and he didn't either. Uh, they had just a very basic ranking structure. William Howler, first lieutenant, William Gregg, uh, second, and I have William Gregg's picture uh, in our supplemental photos tonight, and George Todd, uh, and I got his picture in here too. Okay, so as, as Tro put it, the Eagles were beginning to congregate, and then he told us about the different... Uh, 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 qualities of these men, like Dave Poole, uh, he called it, and listen to this, he called him an unschooled Aristophanes of the Civil War, He la who laughed at calamity and mocked when any man's fear came. But for his picturesqueness, his speech would have been comedy personified. You see, this man, Harrison Tro, is a very impressive individual. No wonder he became the aide to Governor Crittenden of Missouri, and no wonder, you know, that he was uh, a high-ranking Golden Circle member. Um, I'm very, very impressed with Harrison Tro. And Tro wasn't the only one. A lot of these men were educated men. And they had um, some amazing talents and skills. Okay, so we're going to come down now to the... Uh, fight at Charles Younger's farm. And Tro says the new organization was about to be baptized. We might add with, uh, you know, with fire. Uh, Burris, he mentioned Burris was a colonel commanding a, a regiment of federal troops uh, who were taking liberties. They were behaving more like 
guerrilla raiders than they were um, Union soldiers. He says he was raiding generally along the Missouri border, and he had a detachment foraging. Foraging means they were looking for supplies for food, uh, usually uh, at the farms. Uh, probably were not not interested in buying it like regular Union troops did, generally speaking. They were looking for food uh, they could steal from uh, pro-South, uh, pro-Southern people, farmers. So uh, he was in the neighborhood of Charles Younger's farm. I'm sure this Charles Younger, yes, this, Charles Younger was an uncle of Cole Younger, uh, you know, who was associated with Jesse James, the so-called Jesse James gang. Cole Younger was also a, a, a high-ranking member of the uh, uh, Knights of the Golden Circle. And it is said that not only did he survive the Civil War, but that he lived to be nearly 117 years old. There's a picture of him at Jesse's ba- uh, Jesse James's bedside a short time before he died in 1951, and Younger is there sitting in a chair talking to him. Uh, and you can still tell it's Cole Younger, but boy, that man is extremely old. There's no question about that. So, anyway, this involves the farm of the uncle of Cole Younger, and he lived within three miles of Independence, Missouri, the county seat of Jackson County. A whole lot of shaking went on in uh, Jackson County, Missouri, and around Independence, battles and skirmishes. Uh, if you'll go to um, the photo supplements, you will find in pictures, uh, picture number one, this is a picture of the original courthouse that's going to figure into a battle shortly. Picture number two is some of the Civil War era buildings that have survived in downtown Independence. And um, give you a little bit of an idea, flavor for that. Um, and if you look at picture number three, it kind of gives you uh, a drawing and I, a concept of what the average small farm in Jackson County would look like. You know, the kind of houses and, and structures and things. So this is the kind of places that uh, these raiders are coming to steal from. And uh, if you look picture number four, uh, Quantrill uh, was not involved in this, this what's this called the Second Battle of Independence. There were um, actual Civil War battles between regular Confederate troops and Union uh, soldiers. I thought I'd put a picture of that marker to show you that the Independence was a real hot spot uh, of Civil War uh, combat activity. Now, I like picture number five a lot because I think it really captures the feeling of what the New Jersey, con- or New Jersey, hello, the Missouri, uh, you, <laughs> Mike, there was an old joke about, you know, what did Delaware, she wore Missouri's New Jersey. And that's why <laughs> I, I, got, I got the punchline to that old joke uh, tangled around my tongue there. Yeah. That's funny. The kids, yeah, the kids love to play that joke on the adults. You know, they come up, Daddy, Daddy, you know, uh, what What did Della wear? Oh, I don't know, daughter, what she wear? She wore Miss Erie's New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. old Oldie but a goodie. All right. But anyway, you know, just take a look at that picture a minute, picture number five, and look at, look at that road and imagine, you know, a group of, of rough-looking, armed-to-the-teeth men come thundering down that road. If you lived in these houses, wouldn't that be a terrifying thing? Okay. Now, by the way, uh, Independence is about 15 miles east of Kansas City. Kansas City sits partially in Kansas and partially in Missouri. So that'll give you an idea. And right up at the top of Missouri, in the right-hand or left-hand corner as you're looking at the map. So that's the area that we're, we're focused on right now. And, uh, okay, let me get back to my notes here. All right, so this militia detachment, as they were called, Burris's Union Militia, he says there were 84 of them, and there was only 32 of Quantrill's men. So that's over about a a two-and-a-half to one ratio. And look at this. At sunset, Quantrill struck their camp. 
Forewarned of his coming, they were already in line. One volley settled them. In other words, uh, it only took one volley to decide the issue. One volley from the guerrillas. Five fell at the first fire, and seven more were killed in the chase. In other words, they routed the whole 84 men. Now, you talk about uh, a hunt site. If you could find this campsite, it's not just a campsite. It's a battle site. And they were routed. That means they threw everything away that was slowing them down. You know, they, they were, were probably even threw their rifles away. Uh, because when men get routed, their only thought is to flee in the opposite direction from combat as fast as they can. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's a lead right there. We know if, if you could track down uh, the property of Charles Younger if through the records, uh, then you know that the, um, whoever these people are, they're going to be, I mean, excuse me, uh, Burris's people, wherever they camp, it's going to be along a water source like a creek or a river. So those are beginning clues. Uh, it might take some work, might take some dry runs, but there's chances are that this site's never been found because it's not in the official records. All this stuff we're, I, you know, I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, this is the only place that I know of it's recorded. Okay, so even though they knew Quantrill was coming, their scouts warned him he was coming, they couldn't stand against him with only 32 men. And there's a reason for this. And that's going to bring us back to John Jarrett here shortly. Five fell at the first fire, seven killed. Okay. Um, so they ran uh, all the way to Independence, where the balance of their regiment was. And this is what probably saved them from being wiped out. If, it, you know, if they'd been out farther from a town, uh, Quantrill's men would have ridden them down and killed them all. Uh, as they will do later to other units. But this was the 10th of November in 1861, and this is where Tro mentions that Cole Younger, the, remember the guy who had been doing the pistol practice? Cole Younger killed a militiaman at 71 measured yards with a pistol. Okay, so he says that uh, Independence was essentially a city of fruits and flowers. About every house, there was a parterre and contiguous or next to every parterre, there was an orchard. Now, I was going to look up the word parterre, obviously a French word. Uh, I think it might mean garden. If somebody out there will quickly Google P-A-R-T-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, and maybe they can give Mike a definition in chat, uh, I will pass it on. I, but I'm, I'm uh, suspecting it means garden. And uh, so we have a town. Hey, where Dorian, they... real quick. Yeah. Uh, Bill said picture number 17 is is actually old Washington, Ohio, de depicting Morgan's raids in June of 1863. The view is from the mayor's house balcony. Well, let's see. We're a long way from picture 17. Bill's getting ahead of himself, number one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So number two, Bill, this is actually not, Bill, it's a raid of, on Corydon, Indiana. Uh, I used it as an example. If you will look at the, uh, at the caption, it says attacking a town with a Union soldier garrison. I used this to help create a visual image. I didn't say this was an authentic drawing of, of Quantrill attacking independence, okay? So, you know, let, let's... Come on, Bill. Best. Come on. Yeah. Um, i do the be best I can, you know, with what I can find in the time I've got to do it. And remember, Bill, it may not, I may not be perfect, but the price is right, okay? <laughs> All uh, right. Um, hold on real quick. And, and Barb and, and Bill both come back. Uh, a level space in a garden or yard occupied by an ornamental arrangement of flower beds. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, that's the kind of support I like. <laughs> now, Bill, if you could um, put it in reverse and let's get back up there where we are. Uh, you know, we're still around uh, uh, Cole Younger's picture. I Come would on, say. Bill. Come on. 
<laughs> okay. All right. So I'm trying to create visual images here, and uh, you don't know, Bill, I barely got these photos done and up. I worked from noon until 6 o'clock, six straight hours. Would you do that? <laughs> yeah, Bill, would you do I'm sorry. I'm just giving Bill a hard time. I got to jump. I just need to be quiet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we appreciate it, Dorian. I can tell you that. Okay, here we go. That's all right. He got me out of mowing the lawn. It was too hot anyway. <laughs> mm. He said, not only am I with it, I'm ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get back on track. Yeah. I apologize. Good what job, we're Bill. Worried, yeah, what we're worried about, Bill, is that maybe that head will get too big for your hat. <laughs> okay. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> And don't die on us, Mike. We're all gotta... good. I'm sorry. I started to talk and I coughed. I apologize for that. <laughs> right. Just so you don't die on us before the it's finished. I'll be greatly insulted if you die before you hear well, my whole presentation. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I got to turn it off. So if I'm dead, you'll you got a full three hours. So just keep going until <laughs> you need it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So the, uh, he tells us that that independence was built where the woods and the prairies met. And when it was most desirable, there was sunlight. And when it was most needed, there was shade. The war found it rich, prosperous, and contented and left it as an orange that had been devoured. You ever seen a, an orange where everything in the middle has been sucked out and the peel's just kind of laying there on the ground? That's what he's talking about. Yep, absolutely. Uh, he talks about, he says, Lane hated it because it was a hive of, of secession. In other words, you know, there were more people that favored the South and the North. Uh, and Lane, of course, was Senator Jim Lane, who was the uh, commander of the Red Legs, and he was a U.S. senator for all four years of the Civil War from Kansas. And he was uh, the nemesis or the, you know, the deadly enemy of, of Quantrill. And Lane will come back into the picture here before the series is over. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic way. So Jennison, remember Jennison's Jayhawkers that we talked about in part one? Okay, Jennison preyed upon it, upon independence, because gorilla bees, referring to the gorillas, flew in and out. On one side, the devil, and on the other, the deep sea. Patriotism, that it might not be tempted, ran the risk very often of being drowned. Something also of Spanish intercourse and connection belonged to it, its square was a plaza, its street centered there, its courthouse was a citadel. Citadel, uh, meaning in this case, uh, a fortress. It was built uh, not just for the function of being a courthouse, it was built like a fort, thick walls, that type of thing. It says, truer people never occupied a town, braver fathers never sent their sons to war, grander matrons never prayed to God for right, and purer women never waited through it, all the siege, the sack, the pillage, and the battle for the light to break in the east at last and the end to come in fate's own good and appointed time. If any of you listeners did not know what purple prose was, you now know. That is a classic piece of purple prose. Okay. So, versus men flee back to independence. And now there's going to be a battle, the first battle at Independence. Tro tells us that Quantra really had a lot of admiration for the town of Independence and that his men adored it. Uh, I'm sure it was. It's probably where they went to, you know, to pay the taverns a visit and, and uh, take a break from, from their rather uh, strenuous activities, shall we say. Anyway, he says... Uh, Versus regiment was still there. Now, ordinarily, a regiment is about a thousand men. I don't know how many Burris had. Uh, you know, there was always it was always changing in numbers. There would be desertions. There would be additions. You know, new recruits would arrive. There would be casualties, wounded and killed, that would deplete the numbers, so on. By the end of the Civil War, the average regular Confederate regiment was down to between oh three and four hundred men. 
from uh, it, their normal complement of a thousand. So anyway, <clears throat> one day in February, so the regiment was actually fortified in the courthouse. They made that their headquarters. And one day in February of 1862, the guerrillas charged the town. Now think about this. You got an entire regiment. You know, Quantrill's got probably not, not any more than 50 men or 50 or 60, right somewhere right in there. And Tro says, Tro was in this charge. And he says it was a desperate assault. Quantrill and Poole, Dave Poole, whose picture is there, I forgot the number, don't have the right in front of me. Uh, but Dave Poole rushed out, dashed down one street, and, and and that would have been Quantrill and Dave Poole with, with their men, Cole Younger and Todd down another, Greg and Shepard down a third, Howler, Coger, Burns, Walker, and others down the balance of the approaches to the square. Behind heavy brick walls, the militia, of course, fought and fought, besides a great advantage. Except for seven that were surprised in the first moments of the charge and shot down, none others were killed. And Quantra was forced to retreat from the town, taking some necessary ordnance that could, would be ammunition and pistols. Uh, he wasn't much interested in guns. In, any long guns were, were passed to the regular Confederate units if that could be arranged. Uh, if he couldn't, here's another thing. Uh, to think about those of you that might be interested in pursuing Quantrill sites. When Quantrill captured supply wagons and things, if he was in a situation like he was so far behind uh, enemy lines or often, you know, while he's attacking one federal unit, another federal unit is, has been pursuing him behind him, is coming, you know, up behind him. So he doesn't have long to dally. And if he could not arrange to have the, uh, wagon ship safely to Confederate held territory, he would uh, throw them in a river or a creek, you know, deep creek. That was one of his favorite little um, ways of getting rid of arms so that the Yankees would not have the use of them. Uh, what they were really interested in was the pistols because Quantrill's men did not fight with rifles. They fought with pistols. Uh, and if you will look at the pictures of the guerrillas that I've posted in this supplemental photos, Take a look at those and look at the pistols. Look how many. Look look how almost every one of them has at least a pistol in each hand and often pistols stuck everywhere in their clothes. And uh, in fact, let's just, let's right now, let's stop right here. Oh, wait, let me just finish a little bit more on this fight at independence. Uh, they got ordnance, quartermaster, and commissary supplies, meaning food, from the stores under the very guns of the courthouse. None of his men were killed, though as many as 11 were wounded. This was the initiation of independence, Missouri, into the mysteries as well as the miseries of border warfare. And thereafter, and without a month of cessation, it was to get darker and darker for the beautiful town. Okay, now. Let me bring up the photos here, and let's go to the picture of John Jarrett, uh, which is picture number eight. They're all, all the pictures are numbered, easy to find. Now, bring that picture up to full magnification, and I want you to look very carefully. Uh, this... Uh, it was funny because the original caption talked about John Jarrett's three pistols. No, there are more than three pistols in this photo. There is a pistol uh, touching his right hand right about the end of his palm. If you look, it's pointed straight down and the barrel uh, goes into his belt right next to another one. If you look very quickly, you can count one. I mean, look very thoroughly. You can count one, two, three, four pistols. Now notice there's something strange right behind the pistol he's holding across his chest. It looks like a piece of iron or something with rivets in it. Do you see that? And then there's something right below it between the butt ends of the two pistols that are in his belt. 
what you're seeing, I believe, is the only known picture of even part of the secret uh, rig that Quantrill invented for his men that held six pistols. Jared doesn't have four pistols on him. He's got six. Two of them you can't see. But that's why this picture is very, very special to me, uh, because I think it's it's a history-making picture. I don't think it's ever been pointed out before. Uh, the only reason I even know about those rigs with, that would hold six uh, six pistols is because Jesse Lee James got the information from his grandfather, and I'm told that all of those rigs that the Quantos men wore were either destroyed or they were gathered up and they were hidden in golden circle caches. Boy, I'd love to see some of those come out. Uh, you talk about some valuable uh, artifacts. Anyway, that'll give you an idea. Now, let's go right above, uh, go back to picture seven. There's old Dave Poole. Now, look carefully. How many pistols do you see on him? I count four in plain sight. Do you get the idea? Do you see why I'm telling you that they were pistol fighters? Go find, go look through hundreds of Civil War pictures of regular cavalry soldiers, the, the men that mostly carried pistols. Try to find a picture of a Union soldier carrying four pistols. I don't think you can do it because there aren't any. These are the only pictures of men that I know of that fought in the war that are carrying that many pistols. So when I tell you they were pistol fighters, and that means close range, they rode right up and stuck a pistol in your face if they could and pulled the trigger. And if not, they shot you from a few feet away. Do you realize how much lead in a time when the soldiers, Mike, the units, you know, these, most of these guys had single-shot uh, muskets. Single-shot muskets. Yeah, how that's would you incredible. Like, how would you, yeah, how'd you like to go up against Dave Poole with a single-shot musket, Mike? <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Yeah, you better believe, because you'd be missing a few parts when he got done with you. Right. I mean, do you, I mean, that guy, look, that's, that's 24 bullets and that's a huge amount. That's almost like a machine gun in the civil war, you know, because, uh, the seven shot Spencer's and the 17 shot Henry's, uh, they didn't come along till late in the war at this stage. Uh, even the Yankees were, that had, uh, metal, metal cartridges were you, they were single shot carbines. You know, and so you get one shot off at Dave Poole, and while you're jacking that empty shell out of the chamber and, and sticking another one in, he's shooting you to pieces because he's got a pistol in each hand. Mm -hmm. When those are empty, those are empty, he would stick them back in and grab the other two and just keep blasting away. Now, imagine if you were up against six or seven of these guys, just six or seven. Right. You know, what a, what a... Yeah, what an incredible type of fighting they did. You know, that was not that, that's unheard of in any other theater of the Civil War. Hmm. Let's Interesting. see. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, now we'll get back into the battles here. Um, okay, Quantrill says he's swing, swinging back past Independence from the east. The day after it had been charged, Quantrill moved up in the neighborhood of Westport and put scouts. Excuse me, I got distracted by an animal outside there. Put scouts upon uh, all the roads leading to Kansas City. Two officers belonging to Jennison's regiment were picked up a lieutenant who was young and a captain who was or middle age. Now, look what Quantrill does here. He's fighting under the black flag, which means no mercy, no quarter given. Uh, both sides were fighting under the black flag, not just Quantrill. And it's an interesting thing. Quantrill is going to kill these two men. 
But look what Tro says about him. Quantrill always gave time for his captured prisoners to pray uh, before he executed them. Now, that's an interesting thing for a man who is supposed to be a sociopathic killer with no feeling. See? That tells you that's a little window into Quantrill the man. And it, it, it starts, it begins to put the lie to the role that history has cast him in. And we'll see more as we go through the battles. He says, the lieutenant did not want to pray, saying it could do no good. God knew about as much concerning the disposition it was intended to be made of his soul as he could suggest to him. The captain took a quarter of an hour to make his peace. Both were shot. Men commonly died God's appointed time beset by guerrillas, suddenly and unawares. Another of the horrible surprises of civil war. At first, and because of Quantrill's presence, Kansas City swarmed like an anthill during a rainstorm. Afterwards, when the dead officers were carried in, like a firebrand had been cast thereon. So now we get into the second fight at Independence. So Quantrill and his men uh, are at the house of a man named Charles Cowherd. And a courier comes up with information that Independence which had not been garrisoned for some little time, was again in possession of a company of militia. Okay, a company would, in full company, would be about 100 men. Another attack was resolved upon. On the night of February the 20th, 1862, Quantrill marched to the vicinity of the town. He waited for daylight. So as soon as the, the, you know, the first signs of daylight began to appear in the east, that was the signal and they did another dash, you know, right all together, right down Main Street. And uh, it says they, in a swarm of cheers and bullets, a roar of iron feet on the rocks of the roadway, referring to the horses, and more purple prose there. And the surprise was left to work itself out. It did. And reversely, instead of the one company reported in possession of the town, four were found numbering 300 men. So they... They were not full companies, but, you know, come on, guys. I mean, you got, you got a handful of guerrillas attacking 300 men, as it turns out. And they manned the courthouse. They went back to that fortress courthouse in a moment and made of its doors an eruption and of its windows a tempest, and they killed a noble guerrilla, young George. This is a man with the last name of George. I've forgotten his first name. They shot Quantrill's horse from under him, held their own everywhere, and held the fort. As before, all who were killed among the Federals, and they lost 17, were those killed in the first few moments of the charge. Those who hurried alive to the, into the courthouse were safe. Young George, dead in his first battle, had all the promise of a bright career. Yeah, that's often heard about uh, soldiers that they get killed right away when they began to fight. Anyway, none rode further or faster than the charge, and when he fell, he fell so close to the fence about the fortified building that it was with difficulty his comrades took his body out from under a point-blank fire and bore it off in safety. Now, it's little things here. See, we, we're going to be history detectives. Mike, look, think about this a minute here. These are supposedly hardened guerrillas, thugs, you know, not afraid to die, full of rage and revenge, right? Right. And so one of their comrades is killed, a young man in his first battle. Look what they did. They went right. To, they went to him under a terrible fire, point blank practically, and got his body and, and, and did not leave it to the kindness of the Federals. Right. That's pretty amazing. Isn't it, though? And doesn't it tell you something about these men? Absolutely. And you know what? That's exactly the way the Navy SEALs operate. If one of their number is killed during a mission, they treat his getting his body out just like he was still alive. Yeah. Uh, they, they will give their lives, if necessary, to try to get a, the dead body of one of their comrades out and not leave it to the enemy. Yep. Yep. 
You know, and I thought, look at this. These guys preceded the SEALs by 160 years. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, it is. See, see, the thing is, you know, so much, so much information can be gleaned in details that are overlooked like this. And, we, and, it, and it starts to paint a picture of just who these men were and what were they doing. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, part of Quantrill's tactics. Remember, you know, I've already pointed out that, that, I, that I think he was a military genius when it came to tactics and strategy, a natural gifted military genius. And, you know, you know all of his experiences just made him better. It was part of Quantrill's tactics to disband every now and then. And Tro says his argument was that scattered soldiers make a scattered trail. The regiment that has but one man to hunt can never find him. So he says the men needed heavier clothing and better horses, and the winter, more than ordinarily severe, was beginning to tell. A heavy federal force was concentrating in Kansas City to do service along the Missouri River. Uh, that was the given reason, but their goal was really to drive out of Jackson County a guerrilla band that under no circumstances at that time could have possibly numbered over 50. And uh, that was Quantrill, Quantrill's band. Therefore, uh, Quantrill, for an accumulation of reasons, ordered a brief disbandment. It had it all, hardly been accomplished before independence swapped a witch for a devil. Burris evacuated the town and Jenison occupied it. The Jenison Jayhawkers. In his regiment were trappers who trapped for dry goods. Now, this is Purple Pro. See if you get what he's saying here. There were trappers who trapped for dry goods, fishermen who fished for groceries, and at night, passersby were robbed of their pocketbooks, in the morning, market women of their meat baskets. Neither wiser, perhaps, nor better than the Egyptians, the patient and all suffering citizens had got rid of the lean kind, that kind is a word for cows or cattle, in order to make room for the lice. So as referring to, you know, we might say out of the frying pan into the fire, uh, they, they got rid of Burris and they got Jenison and he was worse. So you see the, the trappers mean they were, they were stealing, they were stealing dry goods, you know, things like from the general store that were not food, uh, clothes, uh, guns, you know, holsters, anything like that, dry goods. And fishermen who fish for groceries, so they were stealing. They were stealing food. So the situation of independence is going downhill here. So he says at the point in time, uh, at the place of David George, th th that was his first name, I think, David George. No, there was two Georges. There was David, and there was another one. That, that are mentioned as being part of his unit. Uh, the assembly was as it should be. Quantrill meant to attack Jenison and Independence and destroy him if possible. And so he moved in that direction as far as the Little Blue Church. Well, there's a landmark for you. Here he met Alan Palmer. Uh, if you want to check out Alan Palmer, he's picture number 15. Let me go down there. Bill's probably on picture 24 by now. Okay. Oh, that's There's funny. No, he's, pro he's probably following along now. You gave him a good tongue lashing. <laughs> he's probably paying attention now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's funny. Well, the Bill's come due for all those treasure stories he demanded of me. <laughs> yep. Too bad we need to get Bill around the campfire. We'd have a good time. Uh huh. Uh huh. Bill's a good guy. Good guy. Okay, Alan Hazard Palmer, born 1848. Uh, they're not. It's not. Uh, they're saying it's not sure when he joined Quantrill's band. He was either 13 or 15 years old. You can bet that he had a dead relative to avenge. And he survived the war and surrendered, surrendered at Samuel's Depot, Kentucky, on the 26th of July, 1865. And uh, after the war, he became a cattleman and a farmer. He married Jesse James' sister, Susan. And he died in 1927 and is buried in the Riverside Cemetery, Wichita Falls, Texas. Okay. 
we'll, we'll, we will uh, hear more about Alan Palmer as we go through this. His specialty was he was a regular, as Tro put it, a red Indian of a scout who never forgot to count a column or know the line of march of an enemy. And uh, Palmer reported that instead of 300 Jayhawkers being in Independence, there were 600. Too many for 32 men to grapple and fortified at that, they all said. It would be murder in the first degree and unnecessary murder in addition. Quantrill foregoing with a struggle, the chance to get at his old acquaintance of Kansas, flanked Independence. That means he went around and he stopped for the night at the residence of Zan Harris, a true Southern man and a keen observer of passing events. Early the next morning, he crossed the Big Blue River at the bridge on the main road to Kansas City. Now listen to this. Here's a lead for everybody, for you guys that think you might want to taste the Quantrill's relics. He crossed the Big Blue River at the bridge on the main road to Kansas City, surprised and shot down a detachment of 13 Federals watching it, burned the structure to the water, and marched rapidly on it in a southwest direction, leaving Westport to the right. Well, there you go. That is, I'm sorry, frankly, that's X marks the spot. I believe I could go right to this spot if I were, you know, interested in driving that far. I'm just a little bit too far from Missouri. Uh, but that's a great lead. Now, let me say this for those of you that venture out after Quantal Relics. Remember, they were pistol fighters. What you're looking for is 44 caliber Colt pistol bullets. Now, they didn't all have Colt pistols, but that's going to be uh, the Navy Dragoon Colts. Those are going to be in abundance uh, compared to other bullets. Now, most of the time, they were fighting armed cavalry units, not so much infantry. And the cavalry units would not have been armed uh, shooting the regular old three-ring mini balls. They would have been uh, carbines, and they'd be shooting bullets that might have rings, but they'll have a solid base. There will be no hole in the base of the bullet. So when you find start finding fired 44 caliber pistol bullets, and if you don't know what fired 44 caliber Civil War pistol bullets look like, Google them. You know, just type type in uh, 44 Civil War 44 caliber pistol bullet images, and you're probably going to get a whole lot of pictures of Colt bullets. And so you'll know what you're looking for. And when you find those, remember that, that, and this is in your favor because there were a lot of other battles. If you're finding regular mini balls, three ring mini balls and round balls and stuff, then you're on the site, a camp or a battle site of regulars, uh, Union or Southern uh, Confederate forces. But if you find a battle site and all you find is pistol bullets, and carbine bullets, and maybe some of the brass cartridges uh, from from the Yankee carbines, empty cartridges, then you know that the odds are extremely high. You have a Quantrill site. You see, a little history detective work. Knowledge is powerful. If you know what you're looking for, then you can separate Quantrill sites from any other Civil War sites. What do you think, Mike? Wouldn't that be interesting? Wake up, yeah, Mike. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> up. I'm. I've got you on. Uh, oh, I'm dude. mute, so I don't. So there's no background. I mean, a dog every now and then. Oh, I got. Um, you. you know, you might hear. So it takes me a second to get off. No, that's really interesting. I like that. Yeah. Can um, you imagine? You know, you're out there. You're out there. You know, going, just kind of looking for these sights, and all of a sudden, you know, you get that signal, and up comes a Colt pistol bullet fired. Right, and, and, and then another and another, you know. Well, you know, after listening to to this show, and I'm sure when we get by the time it gets done, it'll even be better. Um, could you imagine then going out and finding some of the relics from this? Uh, how how neat would that be? Absolutely, because you know, you, when you realize what a spatial military force that this group was, to me. Uh, finding their relics is three times better than finding the relics of a, of a regular Civil War unit. Now, right. I, now, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I love to dig any Civil War relics, but 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 still, 
uh, it's just like if you could find Robert E. Lee's uh, belt buckle, you know, <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be a great thing? You know what right. I mean? <laughs> right. Huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and and you know okay. something as you were talking about this, <clears throat> it made me think. You know, in the heat of battle, and you're grabbing a gun and trying. You can't tell me guns weren't dropped. You know, they miss the holster. It goes on the ground because you got to whip out another gun and shoot somebody. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. There well, had you know. to have been dropped pistols. I'm not saying that they're still there. You know, they could have been picked up right away. But, you know, the you know these raids, these quick and deadly raids, you know things were lost in that in those situations. Well, and you, yeah, you're bringing up a good point because think about this. Remember, we, we, these guys are blazing away with these pistols, kind of like in the in the old Roy Rogers Gene Autry movies, right? Right. You know, I mean, they have those pistols that you load in the morning and you shoot all day without reloading. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I watched the guy. I watched the guy. One of those. Uh, oh, I forget. It was a hop along cast here. We, we were watching an old movie, you know, and, and the guy fired 16 shots from a six shot revolver without reloading. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can do that in the movies. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. uh, he, no, but you you prompted a thought here, Mike. Um, they're blazing away with these guns, and you know, with that kind of use, the guns are going to jam. Parts are going to break. Yeah. And what are they going to do? They're going to throw that broken gun down, and they're going to go over to the nearest dead Yankee cavalryman. They're going to pull, take his pistol, and replace it with that. Right. Makes sense for sure. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. I think that there would be an excellent chance on the on the major battle sites, and we're going to get into some really serious battles here just momentarily. I mean, really amazing stuff uh, where anything could have you know could have happened, uh, anything could have been lost. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a good point, and I, and that would be really neat to find a even a broken pistol, you know, from a quantum oh, fight. Oh yeah, right, right. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can just, I don't know if Gypsy's listening in, but I can just, she's probably drooling right now, you know, having right, yeah. th- I don't know if she's about- listening in tonight. I know she, uh, I posted it on, um, uh, uh, when we went live and she, she liked it, but I don't know if, uh, she would have a chance tonight, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure she will. Cause she was real. When I told her how about last week and how into it I was. She, she was really excited and said she'll listen to it. <laughs> well, so. I can see Gypsy up there holding up a, you know, a Quantrill belt buckle. And by the way, let's uh, let's go back to the pictures a minute. I want you to look at. Let's see. Da 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 da. Just a moment. Here we go. Where let's one go of back. his men's uh, got a U.S. Uh, belt yeah. buckle. Yeah. Yeah. Look at John Durrett's belt buckle. Yeah, what's that about? They didn't have any uh, emotional hang-ups about wearing a U.S. buckle, right? Uh, they, you know, if they needed a, if they needed a U.S. Uh, coat, blue coat, you know, uh, because of the weather or something, they'd take it off a dead body and wear it. They, it didn't bother them. Uh, if you'll look again, go up to Dave Pool, and Dave Pool, uh, you can't see it's a smaller picture, but you see it's a rectangular buckle. That's picture number seven. Mm-hmm. That's a U.S. Uh, um, cavalry cast brass belt plate. Oh, very cool. It's got the spread eagle with a wreath underneath it. Sometimes the wreath's made out of silver and huh. the buckle's brass. Yeah, I should. Uh, you know what? I, I I think I will go ahead after the show. I'm going to edit these pictures, and I'm going to put blow-up pictures of those buckles as part of the picture so oh, that you can cool. see yeah, Very so cool. yeah, that's that's definitely that they appropriated. That tells you that they would appropriate U.S. gear in a heartbeat, mm-hmm. because because Poole didn't just appropriate that buckle; he took the whole belt with the holster and everything off of some cavalryman. Mm. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, we're gonna get into a really, really. You think we've had some fighting? We haven't had anything yet. Here we go. Th- this this is where it's gonna get really crazy. All right. This is called the fight at the Tate House. Now, remember they were, um, they'd rendezvoused. Let's see. 
Okay. After the meal at Majors, Quanta resumed his march, sending Howler and Todd ahead with an advance guard and bringing up the rear himself with the main body of 22 men. Knight overtook him at the Tate House. Now listen to this. The Tate House, three miles east of Little Santa Fe, a small town in Jackson County, close to the Kansas line, and he camped there. There's another X marks the spot, Mike. They're small, you know, yeah, they're they're small. They were only there one night and they're small sites. But anything you found there, you know, you would know it was quantum related. Right, right, absolutely. And and I sh- and I should say, I should mention, a lot of these places that are like the Tate House and so on, they didn't just camp there, you know, one time. Uh, they were back and forth, and they may have camped there many times during the course of the war. Okay. We hear you, Mike. <laughs> you you hear me? Yes. Oh, I, well, shoot! I don't know why. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so, Steph came so. in. That dog's crying. I'm sorry. I thought I had it on mute. Hmm. Okay. Well, sounds like things are normal around the hair household there. <laughs> yeah, just a norm, normal day trying to do a podcast. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. No big... All right. All right. All right. Okay. Tell a tell tell Steph to. To get involved in the battle or pull the covers over her head because we're, right. we're, we're about to go to war here. All right. Let's do it. Okay. All right. All right. So Quantrill's proceeding cautiously, and uh, they end up at the Tate house, and he camps there. And Haller and Todd were still out there ahead of him, and no, no communication had passed between them. So the day had been cold, and the darkness was bitter. And the weariness that comes with a hard ride, a rousing fire, and a hearty supper fell early on the gorillas. One sentinel at the gate kept drowsy watch, and the night began to deepen. In various attitudes in various places, 21 of the 22 men were sound asleep, and the 22nd keeping watch and ward at the gate in freezing weather. So they've dropped their guard. They think they're safe. And this there's a big lesson here, and Quantrill's about to get a big one. It was about midnight, and the fire was burning low in the fireplace, uh, when suddenly the shout was heard, the well-known challenge, who are you, arose on the night air, followed by a pistol shot, and then a volley, <clears throat> volley rifles. Quantrill, sleeping always like a cat, shook himself loose from his blankets and stood erect in the glare of the firelight. 300 Federals following all day long on his trail had marked him take cover at night and went to bag him boots and breeches as as, uh, either Tro or Birch puts it in purple prose. Went to bag him in boots and breeches. I like that. They had hitched their horses back in the brush and they stole upon the dwelling afoot. So noiseless had been their advance, and so close were they upon the sentinel before they were discovered that he only had time to cry out fire and rush for the timber. He could not get back to his comrades, for some Federals were between him and the door. And he ran. as he ran, he received a volley, but in the darkness he escaped. Now think about this. This is not like they're, they're riding through the streets of Independence and shooting at 300 Federals in the courthouse. They're trapped in a house, and they're surrounded by 300, and there's only 20, 21 of them now because the guard has run into the woods. 300 against 21, Mike. This is where it starts to get truly incredible. So they knew that the guys inside, I mean, if you're in there, picture yourself, you're, you're one of these 22. You know that if you don't come up with some kind of a miracle here, you're going to die a violent death shortly. Quantrill was trapped, Tro says. He who had been accorded the fox's cunning and the panther's activity. He was trapped. So Quantrill made a mistake. 
He dropped his guard, and now it looks like he's going to get wiped out. So uh, he went over to the window. He looked out. And he saw blue figures in the shadows everywhere. And the fist of a heavy man struck the door hard. And a deep voice commanded, make a light. There had been no firing as yet except for the shot of the sentinel and the answering volley. Quantrill went quietly to all who were still asleep and bade them get up and get ready. It was the moment when death had to be looked in the face. You know, try to put yourself in their position because that's what you'd be doing. Not a word was spoken. The heavy fist was still hammering at the door. Quantrill crept to it on tiptoe, listened a second at the sounds outside and fired and fired. Fired through the door. And he heard a, a man say, oh. And the officer fell across the porch dying. And Quantrill is quoted as saying, you asked for a light and you got it, damn you. Afterwards, there was no more bravado. Bar the doors, barricade the windows were the instructions he gave the men. And they did it quickly. And uh, the uh, fusillade, and that is a constant a uh, stream of bullets was coming from all sides and hitting the house. Now, the Yankees thought that the house, that Tate's house, was a frame house, but it was built of brick. So the shots weren't penetrating. The, man, uh, the commander of the enemy could be heard encouraging his men to shoot low and riddle the building. Presently, there was a lull, neither party firing for the space of several minutes, and Quantrill spoke to his people. Boys, we are in a tight place. We can't stay here. I do not mean to surrender. All who want to follow me out can say so. I will do my best I can for them. Four concluded to appeal to the Federals for protection. Seventeen to follow them. I'll tell you what, I would have been one of the 17 because I would have known that to appeal to the Federals would have been simply giving them a chance to hang me. Rather die fighting than being hung. So Quantrill called for a parley with the commander and he informed, the, informed him that uh, four of his followers wanted to surrender. Let them come out was the order. Out they went and the fight began again. Too eager to see what manner of men their prisoners were, the Federals holding the west side of the house huddled about them eagerly. Ten guerrillas from the upper story fired at the crowd and brought down six of the Federals. A roar followed this and a rush back again to cover at the double quick. It was hot work now. Quantrill, supported by James Little, Cole Younger, Hoy, and Stephen Shores, held the upper story while Jarrett, Toller, Shepard, and others held the lower. Every shot told. The proprietor of the house, Major Tate, was a southern hero, gray-headed but Roman. He went about laughing. Uh, Roman meant he had a uh, a certain dignity that sometimes old age imparts to men. You know, like like for example, me, Mike. You know, I have that, that that certain dignity that old age has given me. And if you believe that, I'll sell you some swampland and you know, and Ari- you know, Arizona. I knew that was coming. I yeah. absolutely <laughs> knew when you said said that. I thought, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, he says the old man, Major Tate, went about laughing. He says, help me get my family out, boys, he said, and I will help you hold the house. It's about as good a time for me to die, I reckon, as any other. If so, be the God wills it. But the old woman is only a woman. Another parley would the federal officer let the women and children out. Yes, gladly, and the old man, too. There was eagerness for the eagerness for this and much of veritable cunning. The family occupied an L or, you know, like the think of the letter L. This is the shape of the house, which there was no communication 
the leg of the L from the main building where Quantrill and his men were, except by way of a door which opened upon a porch. And this porch was under the concentrating fire of the assailants. I think this was kind of uh, what we called in Texas a dog trot house. Have you ever heard that term, Mike? No, sir, I have not. Hmm. Okay, well, you are in a state where they would build, and there's still some of them around, uh, they would build a house. It would actually have a center, um, what's the word, corridor. Okay. Uh, you know, that was like a porch. It went all the way from one side to the other, like right through the middle of the house. So you actually had the house divided into two portions. And the doors on both portions opened out into that middle corridor. Well, that's called a dog trot. Okay, so, I've seen I've seen them. I've, I'll bet, I've seen yeah, I was, I was thinking you probably had. Yeah. Okay. Well, there was something like what we were dealing with here, except this was a bit unusual, and usually the dog trots face each other, and this was like an elbow or like an L, you know, um, if you were looking at it overhead, uh, kind of a maybe an upside-down L. So, okay, we're going to get to women and children, and, and uh, Quantrill's not going to let Major Tate stay. He wants the old man to be saved because things are looking pretty bad. So um, he tells him, he says, go out, Major. It is your duty to be with your wife and children. The old man went protesting. Perhaps for 40 years, the blood had not coursed so rapidly and so pleasantly through his veins, giving ample time for the family to get safely beyond the range of the fire of the besieged. Quantrill went back to his post and looked out. He saw two Federals standing together beyond revolver range. Is there a shotgun here, he asked. Cole Younger brought him one loaded with buckshot. Thrusting half his body out the nearest window and receiving as many volleys as there were sentinels, he fired the two barrels of his gun so near together they sounded as one barrel. Both Federals fell, one dead, another mortally wounded. Now, I don't know if anybody's keeping track, but already we've just been through a few, not even, what, not even five battles yet. And look at all the dead Yankees that are piling up. So yeah, that's a lot. It is. And by the end of the war, it's going to be over 5,000. 5,000. That is five regiments against what, in effect, was one company of Confederate guerrillas. Okay. Um, so he kills, the, he kills uh, both these men, one wounded and dying and the other one dead. And when he did, there went up a yell so piercing and exultant that even the horses hitched in the timber 50 yards away reared in their fright and snorted in terror. Black columns of smoke blew past the windows where the gorillas were, and a bright red flame leaped up towards the sky on the wings of the wind. The L of the house had been fired and was burning fiercely. Quantrill's face, just a little paler than usual, had an act, had a, a look that was not good to see. The tiger was at bay. Many of the men's revolvers were empty, and in order to gain time to reload them, another parley was held. The talk was of surrender. The federal commander demanded immediate submission, and Shepard, with a voice heard above the rage and the roar of the flames, pleaded for 20 minutes. No, was the answer. Then 10, no, was the answer. How about five, no. Then the commander cried out in a voice not a, a bit inferior to Shepard's in volume, and he says, well, you have one minute, and if at its expiration you have not surrendered, not a single man among you shall escape alive. Thank you, said Cole Younger. He says, catching comes before hanging. Count 60 and then uh, be, be damned to you. Shepard shouted as a parting volley. Oh, he Shepard shouted this. I thought Cole Younger did. <clears throat> then a strange silence fell on all these desperate men face to face with imminent death. So the house is on fire. They've only got a very few minutes before it reaches them. When every man was ready, Quantrill said briefly, shotguns to the front. Now, let me explain. You know, while they were not musket fighters, they did have a... 
uh, boots on their saddles, and they a lot of them would carry a sawed-off shotgun uh, because it was a close-in weapon they could use, you know, as a last resort when their revolvers are empty. If they didn't have time to reload, and maybe three or four Yankees were charging one man, he could pull that shotgun and maybe take out all or most of his pursuers. You see, so it would be natural for them not to leave those in the boots on the horses, but to bring them in with them when they. They um, uh, came into the house to seek shelter. So Quantrill said, he said, when every man was ready, he said, shotguns to the front. Six loaded heavily with buckshot. And we're talking double lot buckshot here. <clears throat> uh, these shotguns in the Civil War, most of them were not, you know, we, we, we think today a 12 gauge is a big shotgun. Uh, 20 is a little smaller shell. And then there's a 410, you know, that's, uh, even, a, even a much smaller shell. These were 10 gauge. I found one solid brass shotgun shell. Um, I mean, the whole thing, you know, from, from the, from the base to the, to the end was solid brass. I found one of those on the Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Stones River battlefield. <clears throat> um, and they are 10 gauge. And I looked at that thing and I thought, man, you know, this would be a terrible load to face loaded with double odd buck. Because even one of those buck, you know, is, is, uh, it's bigger around than a 22 bullet. So, you know, it has the potential to kill you. So six men loaded with 10 gauge double odd buck go to go take the front. And behind them were those that had only revolvers. So they formed a charging column in the main room of the building. And uh, he says that one of the men fell to his knees and prayed, and nobody scoffed at him, for God was in that room. Mike, that tells you something, doesn't it, about these men? He is every, Anyway, the writer says he's everywhere when heroes confess. There were 17 about to receive the fire of 300. Ready? Quantrill flung the door open wide and leaped out. The shotgun men, Jarrett, uh, Younger, Shepard, now, take a look, guys. Go back and look at that picture of John Jarrett and Cole Younger in there. Uh, these two men out of the six here were there. They were firing these shotguns, you know, and they're their very pictures. Anyway, they fired away, and uh, let's see. I'm um, sorry, I got a confusing sentence here. Eight and left from the thin, short column, a fierce fire beat into the very faces of the Federals, who recoiled in some confusion, shooting, however, from every side. There was <clears throat> a yell and a grand rush. And when the end had come and all the fixed realities figured up, the enemy had 18 killed, 29 badly wounded, and five prisoners, and the captured horses of the guerrillas. Not a man of Quantrill's band was touched as it broke through the cordon on the south of the house. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to have to grab a drink of water here. And gained the sheltering timber beyond. Can you believe that? <clears throat> to be in that kind of a desperate situation right and to cut their way through 300 men that is incredible. amazing absolutely incredible and this is i mean there was some serious fighting here you know the house obviously burned down maybe there's somebody rebuilding the site maybe they didn't but i'd love to hunt that site you're not kidding absolutely any uh, idea where that is or yeah yeah we had uh, if we back up here um let's see no i mean you personally i mean like have you ever I, I guess what i'm asking have you ever explored any of this when you lived out west um i have i have hunted relics civil war relics in uh missouri and uh I have not, I did not have this book when I was there. 
with all these leads. And I was not anything close to the history detective that I am now. I am much, much, you know, and, I, and listen, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying the years and the practice has made a difference, Mike, a big difference. Oh, of course. You know, I, it would be a lot easier for me to find these sites now than it would have been back in the, you know, the 80s, for example. <laughs> it's uh, ironic, right. you know, back then I had the strength and the young, you know, the vigor of youth. And now I've got the uh, skills of experience, and I don't have the body that'll keep up with it. <laughs> right, right. I get that. Uh, you know, so uh, generally, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hunting sites closer to my home. Uh, but back then, you know, I thought it nothing to drive 400 miles one way to hunt relics. Uh, but boy, the times have changed. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy, you know, uh, I guess I'll have to enjoy this vicariously. In other words, if, if somebody out there uh, runs with these leads and starts finding Quantor relics, please at least just let me know. I don't want any of your relics. I just want to know that as a result of these leads, you actually found some. You know, that, that, that'll be a thrill to me. It really will. So anyway, okay, where are we here? All right. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so they gained a sheltering timber uh, uh, to the south of the house. And uh, it says uh, Hoy, one of the men, his last name of Hoy, as he rushed out the third from Quantrill, in other words, he was third in line, and he fired both barrels of his gun, was so near to a stalwart Federal that he knocked him over the head with a musket and rendered him senseless. To capture him afterwards was like capturing a dead man. But little pursuit was attempted. Quantrill halted at the timber, built a fire, reloaded every gun and pistol, and took a philosophical view of the situation. Enemies were all about him. He had lost five men, four of whom, however, he was glad to get rid of, the guys that wanted to surrender. And so you see, you might say that, you know, the, uh, the less than dedicated men in Quantrill's unit got, they, they, they got weeded out by the intensity of the combat they found themselves facing. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, what Quantrill was left with, it was like distilling, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the men that stayed with him, the men he had left, they just got better and better at what they did. Right. I get that. Yeah. Okay. So he had just escaped from an environment sterner than any yet spread for him. And fortune was not apt to offset one splendid action by another exactly opposite. Choosing, therefore, a rendezvous upon the headwaters of the Little Blue River, another historic stream of Jackson County. Uh, I've got a picture taken on the Little Blue. It is uh, near the end. Let's see. Number, 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 number. Yes, uh, number 24. If you want to see the Little Blue River, picture taken in winter. This is the river we're talking about here now. Okay, uh, he says a rendezvous upon the headwaters. The headwaters means near where the river begins. He reached the residence of David Wilson late the next morning after a forced march of great exhaustion. The balance of the night, however, still had to be one of surprises and counter-surprises, not alone to the Federals, but to the other portion of Quantrill's command under Haller and Todd. Remember, this was about 10 men. Okay, they were in camp four miles south of the Tate House. The battle there had roused them. They heard the, the shooting, even that far away. And they got into the saddle, and they were galloping back to help their comrades 
when a federal force 100 strong met them full in the road. So now, see, they, they're fighting 10 to 1 odds, 10 men against 100. Some minutes of savage fighting ensued. So, Mike, now you've got a second battle within just two or three miles of, this, of the first one. Another battle site. Yeah, that's incredible. And probably none of this is in any history books or anything, I'm guessing. It is not. I mean, there'll be references, you know, but, uh, th I mean, this, this book is a detailed, uh, I, I would, I would say that Harrison Trow was blessed with a near photographic memory. If it wasn't just an out and out photograph uh, graphic memory, uh, he, he, he had a mind for details and that of course would have made him a perfect aide for governor Crittenden because, you know, you want your aide to have a mind for details. Right. Right. All right. So, um, uh, so we got this desperate second battle going on and they're fighting for several minutes. A lot can happen in several minutes of this kind of close up combat. These guys are not, you know, they're not shooting each other from two ends of a field. Uh, this is getting up close and personal, you know, they're charging back and forth and horses are screaming and, and, and guns crashing on all sides. Okay, he said he had, excuse me, uh, he had 13 men, not 10. And uh, he couldn't hold his own, so he retreated to the brush. And uh, he says afterwards everything was made plain. The four men who surrendered so abjectly at the Tate House imagined that if they would bring help to their condition, if they told all they knew, and they told without solicitation the story of Haller's advance and the whereabouts of his camp. So they were traitors. They betrayed their comrades. A hundred men were instantly dispatched to surprise or storm it, but the firing had aroused the isolated guerrillas, and they got out in safety after a right, rattling fight of some 20 minutes. Well, that's interesting because that would have reduced the 300 men that Quantra was facing by 100, and that might have made the difference in him getting away. So rather than you know betray Quantrill, they may have actually saved his life, not intending to. Funny how the fortunes of war go. Okay, now we're going to get into another fight. But if you'll notice one thing, with all this lead flying around, it's not that the guerrillas don't take any casualties. It's just they don't take many casualties. And it shows you that um, for all, you know, you can have 300 soldiers, but how many of them could actually shoot accurately? Okay, April now, spring comes. It's 18, still 1862. Winter's over. Quantrill with 17 men was camped at the residence of Samuel Clark. Now listen to this, Mike. Situated three miles southeast of Stony Point in Jackson County. Man, that is X marks the spot. I mean, leads don't get any better than that. And it, that's another place. If he camped there once, he probably camped there many times. Okay, he spent the night there, was waiting for breakfast the next morning when Cap Captain Peabody, at the head of 100 Federal Cavalry, surprised the guerrillas and came on at the charge. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Hang on a minute. <clears throat> they came on at the charge, shooting and yelling, instantly dividing the detachment in order that the position might be effectively held. <clears throat> Quantrill, oh, sorry, problem in punctuation here. <clears throat> this is Quantrill doing this, instantly dividing the detachment in order that the position might be effectively held. Quantrill with nine men took the dwelling and Greg with eight occupied the smokehouse. For a while, the fighting was at long range. Peabody holding tenaciously to the timber in the front of Clark's, distant about 100 yards and refusing to come out. 
Presently, however, he did an unsoldierly thing, or rather an unskillful thing. He mounted his men and forced them to charge the dwelling on horseback. Quantrill's detachment reserved fire until the foremost horseman was within 30 feet. And Greg permitted those operating against his position to come even closer. And then a quick sure volley and 27 men and horses went down together. You see the difference here? Very few of Quantrill's men missed their mark when they shot. And yet 300 Yankees couldn't kill, uh, you know, 17 men that charged out the front door of a burning house. Badly demoralized. Yeah, the guy's just lost uh, over 25% of his whole force. Badly demoralized, but in no manner defeated, Peabody rallied again in the timber, while Quantor, breaking out from the dwelling house and gathering up Greg as he went, charged the Federals fiercely in return with something of success. The impetus of the rush carried him past a portion of the Federal line where some of their horses were hitched, and the return of the wave brought with it nine valuable animals. It was over the horses that Andrew Blunt, had a hand-to-hand -hand fight with a splendid federal trooper. Both were very brave. One had just joined. No one knew his history. He asked no questions, and he answered none. Some said he had once belonged to the cavalry of the regular army. Others, that behind the terrible record of the guerrillas, he wished to find isolation. Singling out a fine sorrel horse from among the number fastened in his front, Blunt was about to unhitch him, when a federal trooper superbly mounted, dashed down to the line and fired and missed. Blunt left his position by the side of the horse and strode out into the open, accepting the challenge defiantly and closing with his antagonist. The first time he fired, he missed, although many men believe believed him a better shot than Quantrill. The federal sat on his horse calmly and fired the second shot deliberately and again missed. Blunt went four paces toward him, took a quick aim, and fired very much as a man would at something running. Out of the Federal's blue, coat, uh, blue overcoat, a little jet of dust spurted up, and he reeled in his saddle. The man hit hard in the breast, did not fall, however. He gripped his saddle with his knees, cavalry fashion, steadied himself in his stirrups, and fired three times at Blunt in quick succession. Man, what a pistol battle here. They were now but 20 paces apart, and the gorilla was shortening the distance. When at 10, he fired his third shot, the heavy dragoon ball. Uh, see, that's the dragoon colt. Like, just like I said, a 44 caliber Navy dragoon colt. You can Google that if you don't know what it looks like. Uh, the heavy dragoon ball struck the gallant federal man in his forehead and knocked him dead from his horse. While the duel was in progress, brief as it was, Blunt had not watched his rear uh, to gain, which a dozen Federals had started from the extreme right. He saw them, but he did not hurry. Going back to the coveted steed, he mounted him deliberately and dashed back through the lines, closed up behind him, getting a fierce hurrah of encouragement from his own comrades and a wicked volley from the enemy. It was time. A second company of Federals in the neighborhood, attracted by the firing, had made a junction with Peabody and were already closing in upon the horses from the south. Surrounded now by 160 men, Quantrill was in almost the same straits as at the Tate House. See what I mean, Mike? These guys didn't just have, like, one uh, narrow escape. It got to be kind of a regular thing, almost. It hasn't been very long since the Tate House fight, and now... Quantrill finds himself surrounded again. The only thing is he's out in the open. Uh, his horses were in the hands of the Federals, and it was some little distance to the timber, and the environment was complete. Captain Peabody, himself a Kansas man, knew who led the forces opposed to him and burned with a desire to make the finish of this Quantrill and his reckless band in one fell swoop. Not content with the 160 men already in positions around the house, he sent post haste to Pink Hill for additional reinforcements. All right, I never heard of Pink Hill. It's got to be a little town. And it obviously had a federal garrison. 
uh, cause he's sending there for reinforcements. So the next question that would come to my mind is, is it still there or is it a ghost town? It could be totally gone. Uh, it could be, you know, basically just farm fields now. Uh, if you could track that down, that might be another good place to find Yankee relics. <clears throat> okay. Emboldened by their numbers, the Federals had approached so close to the positions held by the guerrillas that it was possible for them to utilize the shelter the fences gave. Behind these, they were ensconced. And they poured a merciless fusillade upon the dwelling house and smokehouse in comparative immunity. This annoyed Quantrill distressed Greg and made Cole Younger, one of the coolest heads in council ever consulted, look a little anxious. Finally, a solution was found. Quantrill would draw the fire of this ambuscade. He would make the concealed enemy show himself, ordering all to be ready and to fire the very moment the opportunity for execution was best. He dashed from the dwelling house to the smokehouse and from the smokehouse back again to the dwelling house. Eager to kill the daring man and excited somewhat by their own efforts made to do it, the Federals exposed themselves recklessly and then owing to the short range, the revolvers of the guerrillas began to tell with deadly effect. Twenty at least were shot down along the fences and as many more wounded and disabled. It was 30 steps from one house to the other, yet Quantrill made the venture eight different times and not less than 100 men firing at him as he came and went. On his garments was not even the smell of fire. His life seemed to be charmed, his person protected by some superior presence. When at last this artifice would no longer enable his men to fight with any degree of equality, Quattro determined to abandon the houses and horses make a dash as of old to the nearest timber. I'd rather lose a thousand horses, he said, when someone remonstrated with him than a single man like those who have fought with me this day. Heroes are scarce, horses are everywhere. There, there is a great little window into the Quantrill's thinking, Mike. He had a tremendous respect for the bravery of his men, and that is the mark of a really good leader. And a sociopath doesn't care. A sociopath doesn't give two cents about anybody else or what they think. All they care is about themselves. Right. I'm sorry. I was having to turn down the baby monitor. She put the baby down and okay. I could hear, I could hear the baby. I had to turn All it right. off. But yeah. So anyway, uh, okay. In the swift rush that came now, fortune favor again, favored you. Almost every revolver belonging to the Federals was empty and they had been relying altogether upon their carbines in the fight. <clears throat> After the first set onset on horseback, one in which the, the revolvers were principally used, they had failed to reload and had nothing but empty guns in their hands after Quantrill, for the last time, drew their fire and dashed away on the heels of it to the timber. Pursuit was not attempted. Enraged at the escape of the guerrillas and burdened with a number of dead and wounded altogether out of proportion to the forces engaged. Now, let's stop right there. Let me read that slowly. Enraged at the escape of the guerrillas and burdened with a number of dead and wounded altogether out of proportion to the forces engaged, Captain Peabody caused to be burned everything upon the premises which had a plank or shingle about it. See, there again, that may be just, may have never been rebuilt. It may be just an empty field now. But did you see, Mike, this, this thing about the federal losses were all out of proportion to the number of guerrillas they were fighting. Yeah, that's, well, that, that's pretty neat information. Yeah, and see, see, my point is we're going to see that that was almost the rule. That was not the exception. You know, that, that, that happened occasionally in Civil War battles, but it didn't happen all the time. But with Quantrill's battles, it was a routine thing to inflict casualties way out of proportion to what he lost, you know, because he, he learned from these encounters and these being surrounded, but look how he thought on his feet. Look how he found ways out of desperate situations. See, the man was not just, I mean, Robert E. Lee, you know, you give him, you give him a week and he'll come up with a battle plan that's second to none pretty much. But 
when an emergency came up and something had to get done, he would give the job to Stonewall Jackson because Jackson, like Quantrill here, could look at a situation and make decisions about what to do about it within a matter of seconds or minutes at best. Lee needed days. Lee was what's called an analytical personality. And uh, Quantrill had that rare, it's rare you see both of these qualities in the same individual, Mike. Now, usually you have one or the other. Right. Uh, but Quantrill had them both. He had long-range strategy ability, and then he also, he could think on his feet. And, uh, well, i tell you what, can you imagine, Mike, think of what he's going through as a school. Can you imagine what kind of graduates this school is going to produce? Right. <laughs> you know, these guys, I said, these guys are going to become, uh, absolutely the, the most, one of the most incredible groups of, of warriors, you know, of enemy killers that has ever walked to face the earth. Well, I guess I should say the road to face the earth because they, they basically uh, were, you know, were cavalry of force. Right, right. <clears throat> okay, let's see. All right, we still got a little time here, right? Okay. Um, okay, this episode is not quite finished yet. Something right. else was... Something something else was yet to be done. Getting out of foot as best he could, Quantrill saw a company of cavalry making haste from toward Pink Hill. So here come the reinforcements that he sent for. It was but a short distance to where the road he was skirting crossed a creek. And commanding this... Now listen to this. Here is a super, super lead. It was but a short distance to where the road he was skirting crossed a creek and commanding this crossing was a perpendicular bluff inaccessible to horsemen. That is a landmark that did not go away. It's still there today. Here he hurried and the work of ambushment or placing an ambush was the work of a moment. George Todd alone of all the guerrillas had brought with him from the house, a shotgun and running for life, the most of them were unencumbered. The approaching Federals were the reinforcements Peabody had ordered up from Pink Hill, and as Quantrill's defense had lasted one hour and a half, they were well on their way. Okay, that was a one hour and a half battle. A lot of lead flew. A lot of soldiers were wounded. A lot of soldiers were killed. Uh, I'll guarantee you there were a lot of relics left on the ground left under the leaves and forgotten. That would be a choice place to find and hunt. As they came to the creek, the foremost riders halted that their horses might drink. Oh boy. Soon others crowded in until the ford was thick with animals. Just then from the bluff above, a leaden hell fell, fell as hail might from a cloudless sky. Rearing steeds trampled upon wounded riders. The dead died the clear water red. Wild panic laid hold of the helpless mass, cut into gaps, and flight beyond the range of the deadly revolvers came first of all and uppermost. There was a rally, however. Once out from under the fire, the lieutenant commanding the detachment called a halt. He was full of dash, and he meant to see more of the unknown on the top of the hill. Dismounting his men and putting himself at their head, he turned back for a fight, marching resolutely toward, forward to the bluff. Quantrill waited for the attack to develop itself. The lieutenant moved right on upward, and within 50 paces of the position, George Todd rose up from behind a rock and covered the young Federal with his unerring shotgun. It seemed a pity to kill him. He was so brave and collected, and yet he fell riddled just as he had drawn his sword and shouted forward to the lagging men. At Todd's signal, there succeeded a fierce revolver volley, and again were the Federals driven from the hills and back towards their horses. Wow. Another great relic site. You know, and really and truly, uh, there is a chance that these have never been found. Right. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying there aren't some smart Missouri hunter that got a hold of this book and, and found these leads, but uh, it would take an army of relic hunters to 
find the hundreds of battle sites because that's what there were those for four four years four years of warfare there were, there were just hundreds of battles like this uh Quant and his men you know they learned from this ambuscade up on top of the bluff and they loved to place ambushes at creek crossings and bridges and things mm. you know so that right there you could probably uh, just hunting, you know, getting a map of the old roads that marked all the fords and, and where the bridges were back at the time of the Civil War and stuff, uh, and just just following those old maps, you know, to to uh, from one site to another would would I'm sure would produce some results. Now, you know, there are some battles, bigger battles, that the relic hunters did know about you know, that are recorded. There are some historical markers, Missouri historical markers and things. But a lot of these things we're reading about, there's no markers, there's nothing uh, in the history books except what we've got right here in Tro's report. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so they were uh, satisfied with the results of that fight and... Uh, and then they made solely as a matter of revenge for burning Clark's buildings. Oh, that's why he, he ambushed him. So Quantrill fell away from the Ford and continued his retreat on towards his rendezvous upon the waters of the Sny. This is S N I, the Sny River. The Sny River will fe uh, will feature prominently in the rest of Quantrill's history. It is an important river uh, in regards to this series. Peabody, however, had not had his way, coming on himself in the direction of Pink Hill. And listen to this now. Coming on himself, that means his own forces, in the direction of Pink Hill, and mistaking these reinforcements for guerrillas, he had quite a lively fight with them, each detachment getting in several volleys and killing and wounding a goodly number before each other, each either discovered the mistake. Boy. Can you imagine? Embarrassing. I guess that probably finished Peabody's career. Yeah. You know, to get to get whipped so badly by the rebels and then ha have a a friendly firefight with his own men. Yeah, that had to have been devastating. Yeah, you know, it's this is interesting. Uh, here's an incident that Tro tells uh, about his own experience in the war. He doesn't do too many of these, but I found this very very interesting. Um, he says, the only prisoner I ever shot during the war, relates Captain Tro, was a black man I captured on guard at Independence, Missouri. He was a black Yankee soldier. And he claimed that he killed his master and burned his houses and barns. The circumstances were these. Captain Blunt and I one night went to town for a little spree and put on our federal uniforms. So you got to remember these guys, you know, it was uh, the death penalty if you were caught uh, wearing the uniform of the opposite side you were on. Mm. But the the uh, uh, the guerrillas are already under the death penalty if they were caught, no right. matter what they were. Right, right. You know, so they didn't care. I mean, they would dress up like Yankees, uh, you know, it didn't bother them at all. So they would dress up like Yankees and then just walk right into a Yankee town. And so this is what Tro and... and uh, Captain Blunt did. While we were there, we came in contact with a camp guard, uh, which was this uh, um, this black soldier and a white man. They did not hear us until we got right up to them, so we, claiming to be Federals, arrested them for not doing their duty and hailing us at a distance. Hmm. How's that for, <laughs> for brass whatevers, you know? Right. We took them prisoners, disarmed them, and took them down to the Fire Prairie Bottom, east of Independence, about 10 miles. And there I thought I would have to kill the black man on account of his killing his master and burning his property. I shot him in the forehead just above the eyes. I even put my finger in the bullet hole to be sure I had him. Well, the ball never entered his skull but went around it. And to make sure of him, I shot him in the foot and he never flinched. So I left him for dead. He came to, however, that night and crawled out into the road, and a man from Independence came along the next morning and took him in his wagon. 
This I learned several years afterwards at Independence in a saloon, when one day I chanced to be taking a drink. There I met the black man whom I thought dead. He recognized me from hearing my name spoken and asked if I remembered shooting a black man. I said yes. I had the pleasure of taking a drink with him. Hmm. How weird is that? That is crazy. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. Uh, okay, well, Mike, uh, it is exactly 9 o'clock your time, 10 mine. We've been going two hours, and hmm. I, am at the end, I am at the end of a chapter. Okay, uh, super. I can go on for another half hour, or we can stop here. I would love to wrap it up. I'm about about uh done sitting here um so okay I would i would like that if we could just wrap it up for the night you could you got a treasure story though so we don't have have bill giving us a hard time e, yeah you i know feel what? like I w- there was a bunch of uh, treasure stories here already well I mean, they're treasure they're treasure they're treasure leads but bill means he, he wants a cash story yeah yeah and uh, we can spell that two ways, C-A-S-H or C-A-C-H-E, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, okay. Where does Bill live? Is he uh, Bill is Bill an Ohio boy? Yep, he sure is. Uh-huh. Okay, let's see. I've already told the one about the KGC treasure buried in the uh, corner of the Capitol lawn. Yes. Yep. Yep, a long time ago. Oh, let's see. Treasure stories, treasure stories. Yeah, I've got one for you, Bill. I've got a good one for you. Uh, Back in the day, as we like to say, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a very colorful character in the treasure hunting community uh, named Russell Hendricks, and his nickname was Hard Rock. We called him Hard Rock Hendricks. And uh, there's a book about him. It's called The Travels of Hard Rock Hendricks, if you curiosity gets the best of you you can read more about him russ was a scavenger extraordinaire and a uh, treasure hunter uh used garrett metal detectors was a personal friend of charlie garrett and russ and i got to be pretty close friends we went bottled up digging and and uh, i was going to go out to california and go prospecting with him he had some gold claims out there on the yuba river uh, that he worked uh really an amazing man uh he died uh, died of cancer back uh, in the in the uh, late nineties, and uh, but he was well in his eighties. He didn't die young, and he had a really wonderful life as a basically a professional treasure hunter. Is what he came down to. He and his wife traveled around in a uh, uh, Ford pickup truck with a little teardrop uh, trailer they lived in. You know they camped in, and. Uh, she wrote this, a story of his life called The Travels of Hard Rock Hendricks uh, by Faye Hendricks, the author. Anyway, uh, Bill, he was from Wisconsin, and uh, he told me, we got to be pretty close friends, and he told me what he'd done with a lot of valuable stuff that he'd found. Behind his house was a field that was about three acres and it had been used as a surface dump. There were literal piles of old tin cans rusting away all over it and other dump debris. And so what he'd done was he had moved one of these piles of tin cans to one side, dug a hole, constructed him a cache, uh, site in the ground, put, uh, a lot of valuables in that hole and then covered it back up with a pile of tin cans. He said, let somebody find that one with a metal detector. So as far as I know, that cache is still there in that field. And uh, I don't know what all's in it, but I do know there are some coins and there are some uh, gemstones. um, And there may be even guns and other stuff. Because Russ did pretty well as a treasure hunter. So, uh, you know, if you can find that field, good luck on picking the right pile of tin cans. (laughs) The right pile of tin cans. That's funny. (laughs) Yeah, that might not be a whole lot of fun, but it might be worth it. Yeah, well, I imagine there's, you know, 
uh, quite a few thousand dollars worth of, of, of things cash there. And like I said, I doubt that he had time to do anything with it uh, before his demise. So yeah, that's pretty neat. Sad. He actually, neat. Yeah, he actually had stuff cashed at several places around the country. Uh, I talked to a man in Cincinnati just recently, and Russ had uh, – I'd introduced the two of them. Anyway, Russ had uh, given him, I don't know, like 50 pounds of a gemstone called Peridot to uh, sell and uh, the guy never got it sold before Russ died. So he still got the paradox. So. Wow. That's neat. But uh, yeah. Old, uh, old hard rock was quite a character and uh, <laughs> he looked like a jackass prospector. He really did. You know, he, 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 you could just see him with a mule out there crossing the Arizona desert, you know, <laughs> with a, with a pick and a gold pan tied to the mule, you know, and all yeah. that. He was just a kind of, rifle. Yeah, yeah. That's he was he he was one of the big big time big time characters, you know, in, in treasure hunting back in the day. And oh, uh, one of my teachers, you know, one of my tutors. Yep. Wow. So. That sure is neat. Hey, do you know uh, you know it's one that I don't believe necessarily, but have you ever heard about uh Fort I'm gonna butcher the name and I apologize, Fort Piquilani up in Piqua, Ohio? No, I haven't. And supposedly the treasure related to that, uh, I can't remember now. It's been so long ago, but supposedly, uh, I want to say it was the, uh, I, I, I hate to say because I, 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 the British, and I think it was during the French and Indian War, but I'm not positive, and I can't remember. I think it was the the Indians were there and they were they cashed uh, uh, buried a cache before they surrendered. They were promised to not be killed and then they were all killed. But you know that's one of those stories that that I really doubt. But uh, it, it's always interest interested me. And as far as I know, and I could be wrong, I don't think Fort Piccolini has ever been found. Uh, now I could be wrong, or not that I've heard of. Now I might be wrong on that, but I I, I don't know. I know yeah. years ago it hadn't been, but uh, I kind of doubt the story. But it could be a real neat place to hunt if it could be found. Some say yeah. I've heard it's on Johnson Farm, but I've heard other people or Johnston Farm. I can't remember, but I tend to think it's it wasn't from what. But you know, it's probably been almost twenty years since I've researched that. Um, but that's actually the county I grew up in. That's the northern part, and I, I grew up in the southern part of the county. But um, huh, yeah, Pickle yeah. County, huh? Yeah, if you look up Pickle Lane, P I C K I L L A W A N Y or something. Um, oh, P- Pickle Laney? Yeah, I butcher the name. Okay, all right. Um, there's a you know I ran across a book, and I'm trying to remember where. Uh, or somebody showed it to me. He had all the forts in Ohio. The guy, you know, he put together a list of all the forts and supposedly where they were located in the state of Ohio. Hmm. And boy, there was a bunch of them. Huh. I wish I could re- remember the title of that book. Hmm. Yeah, Piccolini, uh, this says, was an 18th century Miami Indian village located on the Great Miami River in North America's Ohio Valley near the modern city of Pickle, Ohio. In 1749, a British trading post was established alongside the Miami Village selling goods to neighboring tribes. So maybe it was the French. Yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe it was the French who attacked the British there. Uh, I'm not sure. It was one or the other, though. So they basically, the fort surrendered, and, and so the story's based on them caching the valuables before. Yes, yes. You know, that, yeah. that, yeah, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't have a bad ring to it, Mike. That's, uh, that, is, I mean, that, that, that's worth a little farther research. Uh, you know, I, I get, I mean, I really turn off when I start hearing these uh, uh, cannons full of gold, you know. Mm-hmm. And these army army payrolls that were ambushed on their way to the fort, uh, these mm-hmm. army pay, army payrolls of gold, you know, and of course they they never paid their soldiers in gold. 
uh, army payrolls were silver coins. So, yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's also a story up in Northeast Ohio. Um, oh boy, I'd have to, I'd have to get my buddy Tim to tell me. He actually lived right on that trail, and where I guess uh, it's a big treasure thing but i you know it's another one i tend to think that's false it's supposed to be a bunch of gold coins to pay the troops and uh i just Mm. well um i have no doubt that you know some payrolls got stolen there's too many of them there's too many of the stories and they're the same just at different locations different time periods but uh, so many of those stories are the same for all of them to be true that's true there, there's one you know uh, and there's one in cincinnati supposedly um uh, uh you know the column was ambushed by indians over uh, on the ohio side and a sergeant and uh two troopers got away with the chest with the gold in it and they swam the ohio river somehow put this built a raft and put this chest on and swam the Ohio river and buried the chest on the side of a hill right below Fort Thomas, Kentucky today. Hmm. That's, it's all steep wooded Hills. Uh, but, but that's all the information there is, you know, and you go there and you look at how long that hill is and how high it is. And, and, uh, yeah, you could spend years, years and years, uh, trying to find it, you know, unless you could, I don't know how you do it. Maybe ground penetrating radar now. Uh, yeah. But the problem is, the problem is, LIDAR. is this, yeah, LIDAR might be the way there. Yeah. So anyway, you know, the, uh, it, it's, you can't pin down what happened to this sergeant, you know, that hit the chest, you know, did he, right. I mean, did, he <laughs> right. did he hide it or did he come back and get it or would the Indians kill him or what? Yeah. Yeah. There's so many of those. Uh, I was metal detecting an old school, the turn of the century, and it actually uh, wasn't a school being used anymore. And uh, there was an old guy there, and he had something. To, I think I don't remember if he owned it or what. And I asked him if I could hunt the old school, and he said, "Yeah." And he, we got to talk, and I, I hunted it several different times. And he's like, "You ever heard about?" Uh, the, but it was he told me about a treasure story that was around there, and that was New Carlisle, Ohio, but. You know, I wish I would have recorded it, but at the time, you know, you remember how Lost Treasure all them years, it was the same story, maybe a little bit different, a little different time period. It was just one of those, but I still wish I would have recorded it and done a little research on it. But back then I just kind of rolled my eyes. Of course, I was nice as could be to him, but in my head I was rolling my eyes like, yeah, but um, they're out well, there. It- yeah, the the you know the guys that made their living and hunting caches, they all were pretty much agreed. And you know, I mean, I, the ones I talked to, I was curious to see if, if if there was some unity or some agreement. And there was pretty much a consensus among those that had hunted professionally for twenty years or more that about only about three percent of all the treasure stories are actually worth looking for. Yeah, and you know, so they all had to be really. Well, they were all history detectives. They, you know, they were able to follow clues and, and they, they, they were br- brutally honest about, they didn't let their emotions get in the way. Uh, they would spot things that didn't jive in the story and say, forget that one. Right. You know, right. you want to hunt it, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You know, you know, I think that would be a good thing for a cash hunter. Uh, you know, if you wanted to learn cash hunting, don't get emotionally attached. Don't get emotionally attached. Don't chase something that's not there. But use common sense and don't get attached. It's good advice. Good yeah, advice. It's, it is because you end up, uh, it becomes an obsession. And when it becomes an obsession, you you know, you start taking money out of the house budget to finance your treasure hunting and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, um, the rule that the old timers told me was that uh, don't become a professional treasure hunter unless you can pay your bills for two years hmm. because it'll probably take out long to find your first cash. Right. Right. You know, really seriously. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. And, uh, yep. And I, uh, 
I did that. I hunted for two years professionally. And uh, I didn't, um, I had to quit because uh, I did find, I did find two treasure sites, but somebody beat me to them. Yeah. And I'd bet everything on finding those, you know, thinking they were still there. Mm-hmm. So uh, at, at the end of two years, I had to go back to work because right. I was out of, out of funds. Right, right. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Uh, you know, so yeah. uh, if I were a younger man and found a treasure, I'd do what, what the old guys that were successful did that I knew. They just used, you know, the first thing, their first goal in finding a treasure was to provide funds to keep them able to keep looking for treasures, to travel where they needed to. If they needed to fly to Spain and research, you know, a Spanish treasure, or if they needed to uh, fly from California to Massachusetts to follow a lead or something, uh, they wanted to have the money there to do that. Right. And, uh, you know, when you get in that situation that, that you can, uh, you can follow treasure leads without getting emotional and getting obsessed about them. Uh, and you have the money to follow those leads, then the, the odds that you're going to be successful go way up. Right. Right. Absolutely. Wow. We almost, I think we started another topic, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's finish up and, and call it a night. I'm ready to be off of here and I'm sure you are too. That was a lot of talking, but another great show looking forward to uh, next week, Dennis being back with you and relaxing and tuning in. You bet. All right. Doreen, great show. Thank you so much. Thank you all for tuning in. Good night, everybody. Good night.